From Redox and Healthcare Strategy Bullpen, welcome to Diagnosing Health Tech. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Diagnosing Health Tech. I'm Jeff Englander. I'm the founder and principal of Healthcare Strategy Bullpen, and I'm one of your co-hosts. Welcome to our last show of the year uh, on our inaugural year. Uh, it's been a wonderful year. Thank you all for joining us, uh, and we really appreciate it. Uh, with that, I will welcome uh, my co-host, Sarah Botchen from Redox. Good morning, Sarah. Hey, good morning, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, hope everybody's getting ready for the end of the year, doing your last minute holiday shopping, uh, getting ready for New Year's. Uh, it is our pleasure uh, to welcome Andrea Maresca from Health Management Associates. Andrea is a managing director in information services, uh, and Andrea is here to talk about the Medicare redetermination, uh, excuse me, Medicaid redetermination wave. Uh, Andrea spent approximately two years at CMS, uh, where she was a special assistant uh, to the Office of the Center Director for Medicaid and CHIP, uh, where she advised agency directors on Medicaid and CHIP, the Children's Health uh, um, Program. Also, she served at the National Association of Medicaid Directors for approximately six years with my friend Matt Salo, um, or Salo, excuse me, Director of Federal Policy and Strategy Director there, where she collaborated with the board on federal legislative and regulatory policy agenda. So thank you for joining us here at the end of the year. I know it's a busy time, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. So Andrea, tell us first a little bit about, if you can, for those who are unfamiliar with HMA, um, what HMA does and what you do at HMA. Sure. Um, health Management Associates is a national healthcare consulting firm. We have offices in the vast majority of states, um, we have a presence in Washington, D.C., where I am, and we work with the full range of clients, really, um, in the healthcare sector, from, from payers to state agencies, including Medicaid, but much more than Medicaid, to public health, um, human services, child welfare, behavioral health agencies, as well as payers and providers, um, stakeholder groups who are partnering with them. So, it, you know, we have a, a really a 360 degree view of what's going on in the healthcare sector. And we're working with folks to, to design, to think through problems, strategize, and Im as well as implement solutions that actually will work for them. Thank you, that, that's really um, very helpful. So, you know, one of the things that's happened is during COVID, um, you know, the re or determinations of people's eligibility for Medicaid, was paused so that people didn't lose their coverage at exactly the wrong time when they needed healthcare the most. Um, because of some legislation in April of this year, uh, people's checking people's eligibility or so-called redeterminations were reinstated. And one of the things that happened is, is it, it appears a lot of people or a lot more people than expected had lost their eligibility. And there have been a, a couple of causes. One have been that this is generally a transient population and some of the states have not been able to simply locate people. There have been other administrative issues where people didn't know they had to requalify. So can you talk about you know, what that process has been like and you know, what it's looking like at this point? Sure. So it's really interesting, Jeff, that you say that there are more people who have lost coverage than expected because I might have to differ with you there. Okay. I think it's um, it was certainly aspirational to try to, I, well, let me step back. Pre-pandemic, about 70 million people in Medicaid at the start of the resumption of eligibility operations, again, normal operations, we had 93 million. Mm -hmm. Are we going to go back to 70? No, we're not going to go back to 70. We're going to have more than that. That's because we've, we've, um, identified people who are eligible who, who were enrolled before. We've had several states expand their Medicaid um, program to adults through the Affordable Care Act expansion option over this period of time. So the number is going to be above 80, I mean, above 70. The question is, where do we land? Um, and, and I would say 
we still don't know yet. And there are many factors on a state by state basis influencing um, what that final number will will look like. So, uh, you know, that's a, a really good point. There have been uh, a, a couple of studies and some places where you see people looking at this from kind of a top down national basis. Can you talk about, you know, as, as we talked about in the prep call, the importance of looking at this from a, you know, state by state um, basis and, and why that's important? Yeah. So, the national numbers, the rolled up numbers and aggregate numbers are always going to be important. But in a program like Medicaid, where it is driven and designed so much based on the state landscape, and there are so many decisions that are go that states are making that are impacting how the redetermination process is rolling out, who they're working with, how fast they're going, how they're prioritizing, um, the populations that they're looking at on a month by month basis. Um, and, and lots of issues have surfaced over this period of time that we've that states have already been uh, going through their roles in redetermining eligibility for all these people. Um, so what we've done at HMA is is actually develop a state by state model that predicts, how, um, what we could expect at the end of the unwinding period. So 14 months from now, July, 2024, um, mm -hmm. looking at it at a state by state basis. What we're not able to do through the model is um, we have spread the disenrollments evenly because it is just super complicated to be able to input in like, well, this state is doing prioritization and as we've seen, many states have stopped and started disenrollments, re-enrolled people, adopted new flexibilities, which could impact um, the numbers on a month by month basis. So right. what we're really looking at is at the end of the day, where does each state land? And that, you know, being able to track on a state by state basis is so much more important or not important, but useful um, for health plans, for providers, for community-based organizations to know how their state is doing. Right. So just, just to clarify, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let Sarah in here, it, it, what you're saying is is because of the um, short-term volatility, you've just spread that number over that 14-month period evenly, yeah. um, kind of like a seasonal adjustment. Yeah, right. Sarah? So, oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead, Andrea. <laughs> I mean, we our model is kind of on track with others from that, excuse me, predictions that HHS has made or projections that HHS has made and other other um, entities that have been looking at this. But, uh, you know, I think there are still many factors that are going to influence that final number at the end of the day, what our new baseline for Medicaid enrollment will be. Sarah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, the comment that you made there segued really well into a few questions that I'll have. And the first thing that you said was the state specific um, rules essentially being or the state specific status being important to um, to community workers and caretakers. Where I'll start is how do you keep that organized and what is that like for you? Um, I'm just curious about the back end, maybe technical um, database. Yeah. I don't know. Like, what is that? look like? Um, it's certainly not a one person job. <laughs> it's a lot of, with many things with Medicaid, we're pulling information from all 50 states. We are grabbing their state enrollment reports. We are looking at um, kind of tracking that against our model on a regular basis where we're tracking what flexibility states are deciding to pursue. Um, we're looking at, you know, just yesterday I saw, saw a story about how one state is um, disputing the numbers that CMS is reporting. And so those types of situations are really important because it shows you that you have to be very precise with the Medicaid data. You have to understand what states are reporting on a state by state basis. Who is covered in their program? Are they in Medicaid? Are they in CHIP? Do they cover children in Medicaid up to 18 or 23? 
um, those things make a big difference and they make a difference from a policy perspective and an operational perspective. And um, as we've seen, you know, there could be, there are, um, there could be political implications as well. Sure, definitely. I'm curious what the underlying technology the states use to support that workflow. Is it, I have to imagine it's varied from state to state or even from user to user. Do you mind sharing a little bit about that if there's any info you can share? Yeah, we work, um, my colleagues at HMA work with a number of states. We work with um, many Medicaid managed care plans and providers. And so we have kind of a window and you're exactly right. It's so it's so varied. We have states that are really working um, using antiquated systems, and it's a very manual process still. Um, there are, you know, certainly not every state is in that situation. Those who have been able to automate and and really leverage technology builds um, ahead of this uh, period of time are in a better position. But we still have those states that are um, certainly struggling and could benefit from um, updated infrastructure. Yeah, that's helpful. I think the, the final question that I have before passing it to Jeff is, is there, you know, a common workflow for reviewing that enrollment report and either trying to, you know, find the folks that were administratively disqualified um, and or reviewing if their qualification should be reinstated, if that's even the right word for it? Let me know if that makes sense as a question. Yeah, reinstated is 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 the right word, I would say. Um, there are there are a couple things going on um, that where states are there's a flexibility states can take advantage of that extends the period of time at, um, that they can do some additional outreach um, to people they haven't heard from or if they have questions about the data that was submitted they can take extra time before disenrolling them from the program which is a a benefit if they have contact information for the individual, where it becomes more complicated is if they aren't able to hear from, if they're not able to reach people. And that's where I think community-based organizations and providers really come into play because they're, they have the interaction with individuals, whether that is um, unhoused individuals or other people living in the community in, in different situations. Um, you know, the state agency is not interacting with them. So it's really important to build those relationships state to um, organization, state to payer to, or to organization and providers, whatever, you know, leveraging all of those avenues. Many states are, are looking at those opportunities. That's super helpful. And that actually was a question that I had and hadn't, hadn't asked, you know, how does the community worker get involved? What I'm curious now is, you know, when you're talking about payer to community organization, are those connections that they have that are pre-existing or is that something that kind of organically happens depending on how I guess strong the ties are within an individual state between say health system F FQHC and mm -hmm. community worker of, of whatever type? I've seen many states do a really good job of engaging their their core partners, their core stakeholders to make sure they have the information, um, accurate information, messages that are effective uh, so those people can be be good messengers and can support individuals who are eligible. Um, I, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, I would say we are, um, compared to when I first started working in, in the Medicaid program area, we are, the dynamics and the interest in partnering with organizations has really shifted. There's much more of an openness to build those relationships, maintain those relationships um, than there was probably 20 years ago or, or maybe even 10 years ago. And I think that has also accelerated uh, over the course of the pandemic too. Makes sense, thank you. So Andrea, can you, you talked, you referenced it before, so kind of a two part question. One, can you give a sense of where at the end of this in 14 months, you think we may end up, and I think the number year to date is about 12 million people have fallen, including a couple of articles on the large number of children. And mm -hmm. then, you know, uh, you know, how you see this impacting both payers and providers, uh, you know, and, and what they might want to do in, in terms of, of keeping track of this. 
um, it's interesting. I I read, I was reading a, a newsletter this morning that was talking about projections and, mm -hmm. and estimates and how, uh, you know, they're hypotheses. And um, sometimes we are right and sometimes we are, are wrong, but we, regardless of the outcome, we learn something from that. So with that, prefacing my comment, um, you know, according to our model, around 80 is probably where um, the new baseline would be. But it also depends on a, a number of factors, whether any other states actually expand. Right. Um, do they do new flexibilities impact this? I mean, our model takes into account the fact that on January 1st, 12 month continuous coverage comes into effect in every state for children. So mm -hmm. that that will also, um, you know, that will be extremely helpful. We have uh, federal government now pushing for states to consider multi-year coverage for for children through um, demonstration authority. So that's you know, I see that as a big deal, as a, an issue on the horizon that many more states will be taking a look at. Um, so. About eighty, um, yeah. I think. So it's, that, just so I'm clear, so that's yeah. that's down from the peak was what ninety three ish yeah. uh, during COVID, and up from seventy pre COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. it, it, any thoughts on on you know what the impact could be in terms of uh, you know the the payers and the providers? Yeah. So. For payers and providers, I think what's really interesting is uh, if you've been watching this, I'm, I'm typically a, a Medicaid, I have a Medicaid background, but right. if you look at the marketplace enrollment, it's surging. Um, you know, every week HHS is reporting record enrollments over 2022. So some of the people who are leaving Medicaid are still getting coverage through um, marketplace programs that are available in every state. Uh, you know, the, the, so for payers, they need to be thinking about what's their strategy, or what's their marketplace strategy. Um, and I do think one area that we will, as, you know, as a state, as public entities, as, as payers, um, there will be improvements in that transition. It is a complicated um, and complex process, but I think there are we will see improvement in the handoffs between the coverage programs. Right. Um, and, it, you know, I see marketplace as, a, as uh, something that both payers and providers need to pay attention to because we're going to need robust networks um, as people change between programs. We don't want them having to find different providers every time they change a, uh, their coverage program. Mm -hmm. so um, just, oh, go ahead. Sorry. So, but not everyone is going to be eligible for marketplace coverage. So there are going to be individuals who remain uninsured, particularly in states that have uh, chosen not to expand Medicaid to date. And so that's going to change the payer mix for providers, which is going to be a huge impact. Um, you know, providers should be thinking about, absolutely be thinking about what that impact is, uh, how how they can mitigate some of that. Are there you know, making sure that people who are eligible for Medicaid get enrolled as quickly as possible back into the program. Um, and then thinking about, you know, there are still disproportionate share hospital uh, um, payments, and that program uh, is kind of in flux. Um, every year, Congress has been putting off cuts to the overall number of that program. And the question becomes, at what point do they stop doing that? And what is the impact combined with the number of uninsured people um, and the amount of, of dish dollars that are available to? Right. And, and just, just so I'm clear, one of the things you're saying is, is that at least for the providers, they probably want to make sure they have programs, particularly on patient intake, that are looking at, you know, can patients who are coming in who may have fallen off of Medicaid mm -hmm. be re-enrolled with the proper paperwork and with the proper support. Yeah, exactly. And if they have, you know, there was um, additional guidance put out this week from HHS just encouraging states to continue to work with plans and providers 
to make sure they know the enrollment date of uh, their enrollees and their patients so they can help them in advance, make sure that they are taking the actions they need to. So that's absolutely something that providers could work into their workflow. Um, not saying it's an easy thing, but it is a, a step that could be taken in partnership with state agencies and plans. Right. All right, Sarah, I got you back to workflow. So you're up. <laughs> I know. I was just going to say, put the tea up. I mean, I'm curious about how taxing that is on the provider um, and what the work looks like. And for a patient, if they do that work, what is the time frame that they, for them to be re-enrolled? Um, yeah, I wouldn't underestimate the the administrative nature of it, the work that's required people to be trained within the provider to be able to help um, patients with that process. It is not easy. Uh, what could help them is if states could also do more on the front end of the automatic renewals. Um, so that's you know something that C the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid has been pushing pretty significantly, this process known as ex parte renewals, which is an automatic process. There's, there's clearly a lot of room for improvement. I think realistically, there was more, um, more confidence or, or more expectation of that process that states would do that. I think that there's a misunderstanding or a disconnect in how ready and able states were to use those processes at the start of um, this unwinding period. But it is an area for um, improvement on the state's part that could help alleviate and diminish the burden for providers down the road. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh, entirely. Yeah. I think that's it for me. Um, so so one of the things that, that I wanted to discuss, and, and let me see if I can frame this kind of succinctly, um, I uh, am fortunate enough to sit on a housing and homeless committee down south and kind of sit as a fly on the wall and try to help them where I can, given some of my financial background. And one of the things that came up when the eviction moratorium was on was that, you know, some very well-intentioned legislation required people to supply bank statements and other things to show that they weren't getting income and things like that. But, you know, given that, that some of these people were in a very train, you know, some of the underserved were very transitory, um, you know, may not have had computers, didn't have printers, um, they, you know, may have moved from place to place. They may not have had these physical bank statements. It was difficult for them to show these things. And I'm wondering, has this similar type of phenomenon occurred with redeterminations? And are there anything you can suggest maybe to community organizations or providers or even payers um, that are working with people um, to help them fulfill some of these, as I say, well-intentioned, but sometimes difficult to accomplish um, pieces of, of um, you know, regulatory apparatus. Yeah, I think there are certainly some states that steps that states can do to modify their eligibility or and renewal policies to um, better support individuals in that situation. And I, I think that will be one of the areas, you know, after at the end of this process, there will certainly be many best practices, lessons learned um, coming out of this. And I think there will, that will certainly be a piece of it. How do we help and support people who um, don't have ready access to the documentation? Mm -hmm. and, and there are, are there are ways and there are some states that are um, addressing that. And, for community-based organizations and providers working with those individuals, it's a it's a very intense process helping them through that if they do have to provide documentation. And um, you know, I I, I don't know uh, what else other than uh, trying to minimize those requirements for people who clearly don't have income um, going forward. I, you know. People are always there. Are, oh, there's always going to be a segment of the population that will need that assistance. Who are, who are, um, their situation is changing. They're new to having to submit these kinds of requirements. Uh, so there's always going to be the need for support. What I think providers need to do is just understand what the state um, and and CBOs need to do is understand what the state rules are. 
um, and that is not a not an easy process. Um, states can also, as I said, the automatic uh, automating eligibility determinations and utilizing information that's already available somewhere within mm -hmm. <laughs> either at the federal or state level will also help minimize the number of people that could be required to take proactive action. Right. Let me ask you this, and one of my favorite interview questions has always been, is there a question that we didn't ask or something that, that you thought important to highlight in terms of redeterminations and how they'll play out that, that we you know maybe didn't talk about but should have? So you did ask me about technology. Um, and one of the things that uh, my colleagues and I have been talking about is the Medicaid program's reliance on postal mail. Um, and that is a requirement and that really, you know, we have to, we have to move beyond that. Um, it, it, I think that's one of the, the major things that needs to be re-examined and, um, would make everyone's life a lot easier, right. uh, yeah. if we kind of refreshed our <laughs> expectations and requirements around that process. It, it, and just so I'm understand, you mean to, to reach out to beneficiaries to make and then make them aware, hey, you have to requalify or we need this information. So uh, is it just that they're not reaching out by email or in certain states they're prohibited from reaching out by email? And, and what do you think might make that process better? Requirements around like hard copy letters being submitted via postal. And we just need to, certainly there are some privacy issues and we want to protect people's information, but we want to make it as easy as possible to share information about where we can find people. And um, if we do have to provide them with information, how to get it to them. Right. And, and that actually leads me into one other follow-up question. Given your years of experience in Medicaid and SHIP, um, is there something or some nugget that you would talk to payers or providers about, about how they can interface with the Medicaid community that might make them more effective? Something you would want to, you want to always wanted to tell them for these years, but, um, you know, as a consultant, I know you hold these things in and, you know, um, may not have wanted to share. So, um, I'm actually pretty um, upbeat about the fact that there's a lot more communication going on with smaller organizations in communities who who touch these individuals on a daily basis. There are, you know, the fact that we are engaging patients um, much more extensively than before is an enormous improvement. It does take time. It takes effort. It takes effort to kind of sort through what can we do versus um, to make the experience better and make sure people are getting the care and services that they they need. So, you know, that's really been one of the, the issues that um, has been top of mind for me is how do we continue to build those relationships and just collaborate? Um, I think everybody shares the same goal at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Sarah, any, anything else from your end? I mean, the, the wish list question was was top of mind. I think, you know, with the advent of big data and thinking about how data can help us just have smoother operations, I'd be curious to hear if there's any anything else on that list, either something that makes you excited about where the future of the technology is headed um, or, you know, that's that's also needing improvement that you see better data facilitating. Or, or anything, it can be more general from a technology standpoint, but would love to hear your perspective there. Yeah, addressing some of these thorny issues about how we keep people enrolled when they're at eligible, I think is important in, in continuing to look at what technology and what policy changes can support that um, is super important as we move more into a value-based care environment where we have expectations that these types of arrangements are going to be occurring between the state and payers and providers. Because if you have people coming on and off the program throughout the year, it is much harder to um, achieve your goals for a patient to remain healthy, for them to continue to get the care that they need, and for payers and providers to meet the expectations 
that are set out in value-based care arrangements. Um, if you have people on and off throughout the year, you're not going to, you don't have continuity of care. And that is so important. If you miss one visit, um, you, you kind of have to restart. And it's hard to track people if they're not um, enrolled continuously for that time period. Yeah, 100%. Even thinking about it from a systems perspective versus a patient and clinical perspective, every time a patient moves to a new plan or moves off a plan, your ID is different. And so yeah. identity management and making sure that you know who the right person is mm -hmm. within the database even is challenging. And I wouldn't yeah. say impossible for sure, but it, it adds a complexity that a lot of organizations um, aren't ready for. Yeah. Totally so Andrew, we have a, a question. Oh, excuse me, go ahead. No. Nope. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted a couple of times today. I apologize. Uh, my wife will, will take care of that for you. Um, she will be <laughs> um, and if she doesn't, my son will. Um, so a uh, question from the audience. Um, what are states doing? And thank you, Michael. What are states doing to evaluate and implement new data parameters surfacing to expand coverage for undocumented populations? Mm -hmm. What are those states doing to plan increased demand for demands, increased demands and services? And please, folks, do keep the good questions coming. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm your person on that first one. That would cert, that would be um, something I need to talk about with colleagues in terms of the the data parameters. But what are they doing to plan for increased demands for services? Um, you know, states do projections of their enrollments. Uh, they look at when they're looking to expand services or to new populations or coverage expansions for undocumented populations. They have a sense of um, how many people and how many providers will be needed to meet the increased demand. So as I think probably a lot of the listeners know, we already have a lot of pressures on the workforce and workforce shortages. So that's a huge communication, a uh, huge challenge when we're talking about adding um, additional individuals in any category. So I think states are trying to look at what kinds of, um, uh, um, sorry, licensure issues, uh, expanding scope of practice, better utilizing community health workers, um, direct support workers. Um, telehealth is, is certainly a hot topic and, and something that states have a lot of flexibility uh, to think about using in different and new ways. So those are some of the options that um, we hear talked about the most. So Andrea, one of the things, uh, one last question for me is one of the things we've run into is people we've worked with sometimes don't understand the level of of kind of how far back some of this technology systems are and um you know even sometimes that you're on paper uh you know when you're dealing with community organizations and one contact and another contact here and literally the database is a three ring binder that two people are updating in paper and any suggestions you can uh, or you would have for for people working within this space to kind of get the lay of the land in terms of the level of technological sophistication and what they may be facing? Yeah, um, certainly we would love to have every state having a highly robust and modernized systems. The re that's not the reality that we see. And in fact, we're working with um, we've been in situations where the state has really antiquated infrastructure. Um, like you said, Jeff, paper paper processing, paper handling, yeah. even in some of the states that are uh, more, have more modernized systems with some of the complications that have happened during the redetermination period, they're manually processing, like re-enrolling people and manually looking at their uh, um, going through the cases. So that happens probably more, a lot more than we would like to ad admit uh, as, you know, across the Medicaid program. But I think it, it really varies a lot. You know, we're in some states, it may be getting from the 1970s technology to the 1990s. And you're still 
uh, two decades behind. <laughs> so we, in some states, there's certainly a lot more progress um, and improvement to be made than, than in others. That's great. Um, well, unless you have anything else, Sarah, um, I just wanted to really thank you, Andrea, for taking your time, especially at this time of the year. I know it's busy. Um, I know you have a lot of things you're trying to wrap up and a couple of little ones at home that I'm sure are getting ready for the holidays uh, very busily. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, we will move into our quick take section of the show where we'll talk about a couple of news stories. Andrew, you're welcome to hang out, but you are more than welcome to click out and, and go take care of your, your other responsibilities. And we wish you a, a very happy holiday and a, and a wonderful new year. And thank you so much for all of your time. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Nice talking with you both. Great talking with you. Thank you. Okay. So we'll move into our quick takes here, and this is our section where we uh, talk about a uh, number of news stories that have generally been uh, fairly uh, high up in the news, and then Sarah and I talk about a couple that are not as well covered that maybe uh, we feel should be on people's minds. So first, uh, a story about a Moody's um, uh, study that nonprofit outlook uh, for not-for-profit hospitals is to continue deteriorating in 2024. A couple of key takeaways. Uh, I'm sorry, not Moody's, it was Fitch, apologies. Uh, recent report from Fitch Rating says the outlook for providers was still deteriorating in 2024 um, due to staffing shortages and inflation. They said that managing your employee expenses, which is the single largest number for um, hospitals, is going to be your key issue in 2024. Uh, the single most important. Uh, the uh, study also, or the report also said labor, sh labor shortages will persist for the foreseeable future and that they expect the ability to manage labor shortages is really um, going to be a key for CFOs and financial stability. Um, and they did say that while labor shortages and financial pressures are expected to continue um, to incrementally affect uh, operations in 2024, there will be some opportunities for growth and that, you know, CFOs really have to continue to follow the industry trends and plan for gradual improvement. Uh, and, you know, this will continue to be an issue. I will expect it to be, I do expect it to be a tough year uh, for hospitals, um, particularly um, as I think some of the funding slows down both, and we'll talk about this in another story for VCs, um, and startups. And so, uh, you know, it could be a little bit of tough sledding with some possible, um, you know, nice opportunities or uh, improving opportunities. Uh, second story was a story from the Kaiser Family Foundation that disparities in health measures by race and ethnicity among beneficiaries of Medicare Advantage, which we talked about last week with Tom Scully. It was a review of the literature and uh, the study said that Medicare Advantage enrollment has increased steadily, uh, particularly among people of color. And as of 2021, 59% of black Medicare infant beneficiary, uh, beneficiaries were enrolled in MA, 67% of Hispanic beneficiaries were enrolled in Medicare Advantage, 55% of Asian and Pacific Islander. Um, Medicare beneficiaries were enrolled in MA, and this compared with 43% of white beneficiaries. Um, and so I think this is particularly important, um, as we'll talk about, as the changing uh, complexity and demographics of MA will um, really impact um, how people provide services. The review itself examined the differences in the quality of care um, between people of color in MA and white Medicare Advantage enrollees. Um, and it looked at 20 studies published between 2018 and April 2023. The, study, the report found that Black Medicare Advantage enrollees fared worse than white enrollees um, on more than half of all measures examined, and Hispanic Medicare Advantage enrollees fared worse than white enrollees on more than a third of Medicare um, Advantage, uh, and, excuse me, on more than a third of the measures examined. Um, what's really interesting, as I said, is with more than half of Black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islanders enrolled in Medicare Advantage, the studies show how people have to have insight into how the plans are serving the people of color, how you make sure that your materials um, are 
um, both in the appropriate language and are both culturally sensitive. And I think um, that you make sure that there are a significant emphasis on, um, you know, addressing disparities in care, um, you know, both outside in your commercial population and in your Medicare population, and that we do have a ways to go. Our next article, which I thought was particularly interesting, was the Boston VC firm OpenView Partners winds down and dissolved its $570 million fund. This was particularly interesting because um, Boston-based OpenView Partners um, is winding down, and this was nine months after closing a fund where they just raised $570 million. The raising was a little bit short of their target, but this was not um, a small fund. This was a fund that had $2.3, uh, $2.4 billion of assets under management, had been around for a while. This wasn't a fly-by-night outfit. They had put money in Calendly, Datadog, and Expensify. So um, I think this is particularly significant. Uh, moving forward, OpenView will work only to support existing portfolio companies, and the firm has parted ways with its investment teams. I think part of the issue here is venture firms are going to be increasingly um, required to really differentiate themselves and show what their value added is. Um, I think you you know hear stories about zero marginal cost of, of um, uh, you know software and other kind of um, newfangled things. I just don't think that exists. You know, zero marginal cost of uh, software um, you know is, is really you know, um, not something that adds value. Um, and I think the, you know, other thing is there's a lot of speculation around this and there's going to be increased consolidation, both in the startup world in terms of the funding difficulties and also in the VC world in terms of their ability to, um, you know, raise funds and continue to differentiate themselves moving forward. PitchBook uh, came out with a, um, a stat the other day that the number of active U.S. investors which they classify as um, making two or more deals in uh, through the first three quarters of 2023 fell by 40 percent compared to the same period last year. And I think that's going to be, you know, uh, a huge issue. Um, uh, one other uh, story, um, which has been uh, big in the news, Cigna pulled off, uh, called off its deal with Humana. Uh, they plan to pursue a $10 billion buyback. Um, the health insurers couldn't agree on the financial terms of what would have created a $140 billion giant. Uh, Cygnus stock has dropped about 10%. Uh, they do plan to pursue a $10 billion buyout, um, and or, I'm sorry, $10 billion stock buyback. Cigna also, which is focused on the commercial insurance, um, is gonna continue to explore the sale of its Medicare Advantage business. Both Elevance and Healthcare Service Corporation are allegedly competing for the MA business which could fetch as much as $3 billion, according to Goldman Sachs. Uh, Cigna's MA business is about 600,000 uh, MA members, makes it relatively small. Um, Elevance makes more sense as a potential partner because they have a larger footprint, but this could be a big deal that's transformational for HCSC. Uh, uh, so we'll remain focused on what that is. And our last story before we get back to Sarah is healthcare mergers and acquisitions a peep into the future. Uh, as of 2023's third quarter, activity within the digital health world is hitting its lowest point in three years in terms of uh, M&A. Healthcare companies are, you know, caused, this is caused by a couple of things. Healthcare companies are facing shrinking valuations, um, and this could help rebuild the M&A market because it could make them more appealing as targets of acquisitions. Could be a little pickup in 24 because of this reason as well as um, healthcare companies looking to invest more non-core assets, like Cigna is selling its MA business, as well as the fact that new players, uh, new technology companies, uh, as well as VCs, we saw General Catalyst forming its uh, healthcare companies as well, may enter the healthcare industry. Areas of focus, um, as Andrea referenced, value-based care, talking about remote patient monitoring, uh, which we'll be talking about at the JP Morgan conference upcoming, mental health, and of course, artificial intelligence. We do expect there'll be a lot of consolidation in the digital health space and in the VC space in 2024 going forward. As you move from simply kind of growing revenue, showing AAR and growth in sales to creating long-term sustainable business models. 
Um, so with that, uh, we'll finish up our quick takes and I will turn it over to Sarah to uh, give me a two second break to grab a drink and talk about our discussion. Yeah, we've got yeah. a couple of meaty topics for you. You know, as far as Cigna and Humana goes, I heard that it was their marketing teams couldn't get together to find a new name. Sigmana didn't land. <laughs> so that that's what I heard there. But How I think long have you been waiting to say that, Sarah? Literally three minutes. I'm counting. <laughs> um, it's the old dad joke where you're waiting and it's like, I can't quite hear anything else that's going on because I got to get in my quip. Anyway, so we've got a couple that are interesting for you. The first one here is, yeah, healthcare industry fights back against the crackdowns on health data tracking. So the premise on this one is pretty easy to understand. You know, when you go online, you've got cookies that are tracking and that can be used for a number of purposes. And when we look at how, you know, in the EU, they've handled this. They've got laws like GDPR that have been established and that are pretty rigorous. Um, but the United States has, you know, so far failed to pass the same level of comprehensive federal data protection um, requirements. And so in, in, instead, you know, we've got individual agencies that are um, creating, they're hardening up against these trackers. And, you know, when they fail, when they, when they, don't believe that they are appropriate or in the best interest of the patient. So companies like Redox is an example. Is GDPR compliant um, as something that we feel like we have to do to stay relevant, but it's also something that we've elected to do. At any rate, at the end of 2022, um, D Department of Health and Human Resources clarified how covered entities are using third-party trackers, um, and they believe that they can fall afoul of, of HIPAA. And so for the first time ever, they've enforced a health breach notification rule. And essentially, in telling health systems that um, they need to have rules against these advertisings and retargeting um, that could be based off of health information. So part of this is because of uh, research that was done in 2021 that showed that almost 99% of health systems and their websites use trackers. So created a lot of concern about, you know, how that data was being used. So right now, you know, the theme that I have today is, is lawsuits. There are over 50 lawsuits that are being held up against healthcare organizations related to these, cracker, these trackers and cookies. Um, and there's even one that's specifically um, related to data that could be, you know, shared to uh, things like Meta, you know, and obviously you wouldn't want your, your health information up on Facebook. But, you know, with all of this, some health systems are pushing back, stating that, you know, the data that's being collected can be impactful to patient care. And one example that this article gave, which I thought was meaningful, was geographical location. So we've talked about social determinants of health here. You know, in order for patients to get appropriate resources and, you know, be to be directed to the appropriate service, potentially, you might want to know their location. So there's, you know, the push-pull here where obviously we want more protections for patients, but there is some, you know, technical value in collecting information that can be used for other things clinically. So would be curious to hear your take on that. I, I, I think I, I understand, you know, kind of the AHA's point because it was a fairly narrow interpretation of what was going on and it was fairly strict in a, in a in a pretty quick fashion. Um, but I do think you have to be careful, um, you know, as a provider and, you know, even in, in other realms to really make sure that you have, you know, very strong informed consent. And you're also doing a really good job throughout the organization, understanding where this data is, is being collected and used. And I think we um, talked about this in a previous quick hit, that you have to have not just marketing involved in this, you have to have compliance, you have to have IT figuring out, you know, where, you know, looking at these contracts, figuring out where this data is being used. The other point I'll make, and I think the article makes this point as well, is, is one of the risks, and I think this is a serious risk, is, is as these organizations, um, you know, HHS and other regulators begin to look at what data is being collected, where it's used, you have to be very careful because this could create a Pandora's box. And so you have to know, you know, what data you're collecting, why you're collecting it, where it's going to be used. And you have to make sure that you have specific reasons for all of these things. Um, and that it's, you know, really buttoned up very tight. Um, so those would be my couple quick thoughts. 
Yeah, and the only follow-on I'd add is, I mean, if it's leading towards a more GDPR-like stance where patients can assess all the things that you just said and say, you know, I revoke that or, you know, I disagree, that gives more power into the hands of the consumer. And most health systems have end-user privacy agreements that they have patients sign. It could just be, you know, expanding those to be a little bit more thorough or sophisticated if they're more generic in nature. Though, of course, that's kind of broad stroking, you know, a, a pretty complex problem. Yeah, I think one of the things is if they don't do as good a job as they could, is, is like, you know, who's this data going to be shared with and, and why? And, you know, a lot of studies indicate that people in general are okay with sharing some of this data as long as it's disclosed and why. Um, you know, as you pointed out, for social determinants of health purposes, you know, a lot of people would really have no problem with sharing that data as long as they know, you know, what purpose it's, it's gonna be used for. Yep, totally. Well, let's jump to the next one so we could see that little um, flash forward there, perfect. So yeah, New Jersey's telehealth restrictions, cutting off access to life-saving care um, as the yeah. lawsuit alleges. So this article is coming off the heels of, you know, the COVID expansion of telehealth and, um, you know, through COVID and, and certainly now, but even as early as, you know, 2021, states have been rolling back the flexibilities that COVID allowed. And through that, there's been a ton of frustration from providers and patients about how the rules um, that are being revoked um, are burdensome to them and keep them from getting care. And uh, a key point of contention in the article is, um, and, and the reason why the lawsuit exists is, is because providers are um, being, they're frustrated that they can't practice outside of their home states. So um, through COVID, there was more flexibility there, but today, like before the pandemic, um, telehealth can only be practiced, at least in New Jersey here, if they're licensed in the state where the patient is physically located. And so of course you can understand that creating a potential trade-off between the pa patient when they're looking at their quality of care, quality of life, you know, the ease of access is a really big consideration there. Um, there's there's a couple different, you know, positives that providers, you know, say that having more flexibility offers, um, but there are a lot of, you know, opportunities from a patient perspective as well. So if you're thinking about state-based licensure, if that didn't exist, you could have patients across the U.S. seeking care from, you know, academic institutions that might be focused on your specialty area where you have need. And there was a quote from Memorial Sloan Kettering um, in the article that I thought was really helpful there, you know, saying, hey, there's a lot of opportunity that could be created there. So I think, um, you know, essentially by creating this lawsuit and suing, this lawsuit was suing the New York, New Jersey Medical Board um, and potentially eventually more states they're hoping to inspire action by creating attention to some of the limitations that, you know, state-based licensure uh, requires. So curious to hear your thoughts on this, Jeff. I, I, I think this is a super interesting and a, and a super contentious area. Um, I, I will say that um, I, I do understand the arguments and, and uh, you know, I, I I have a problem with 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 some of the difficulty in terms of you know cross border licensure and everything, and um, I, I think that's best left for another time right now. But what I would say is what I'd like to see is I'd like to see um, you know greater focus on some of the state compacts. Um, you know, thirty nine states have now signed the medical licensure compact, and you know it makes it easier and faster for physicians. The other thing I, I I'd like to see is 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 opposed to this getting you know held up in court and forever litigated um, is I'd like to see some of the states come together and say, hey, for specialty care, for rare disease care, for high risk care, that we create some kind of a, of a, an instantaneous waiver or something like we did for COVID. So, you know, hey, if someone someone needs a, a, a cancer specialist who is, is in, a, in another state or, you know, isn't it available within your state, you can get this care. Um, you know, if you choose to go see a cancer specialist or something in another state, I think that would really be wonderful. Um, so, you know, like to see that and, and, and also like to see, um, you know, more work on the state compacts because I think the, 
you know, some of the licensure rules are, you know, um, uh, you know, held over from another time and place. And maybe there's some way we create some kind of a large net profit pool for cross state licensure and all the, you know, state licensure boards figure out how to share in that or something like, uh, you know, we have in baseball where all the owners share and, you know, TV revenue. So, um, to make it easier. Um, so love to see something like that. Yeah. I love that. One of the things about the, um, 39 states. The only the only comment that I or the only nitpick I would have there is, and the article talks about this too. It still costs something for the providers to maintain licensure across different states, and so it does have a component of solving the problem. But it's basically a provider takes the burden of being able to, you know, practice in multiple states instead of an approach that's more like the one that you suggested for specialties, which I think sounds, you know, fantastic. The other yeah. thing that is seeming to happen or that they're pushing for is concepts like reciprocity. So I think, you know, if you look at how this could be practically shifted, if you were to look at a provider serving and performing telehealth in the adjacent states around them, you know, where likely is your patient cohort, you know, probably within at least a somewhat similar geographical region. I and mean, not yeah. the perfect solution, but it at least could be a little bit better than, you know, sticking to, to your home state only. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. So I know that we're at time. I imagine you'll want to wrap, Jeff. Um, well, um, I, I, I do want to wrap and, and I do briefly want to say thank you. Um, you know, we started this uh, in you know, late August, uh, you know, kind of an idea that we've been kicking around for a while. Really want to thank everyone who's joined us for our inaugural uh, year. Uh, we have a, we had a lot of great guests. I'd like to thank all of them in aggregate. Um, and like to thank all of you for joining us. Particularly like to thank uh, David, David um, Abby, and Catherine. Unfortunately, who's no longer with us, but you know uh, David and Abby behind the scenes who do all the hard work. I'd like to thank you, Sarah. Um, I'd like to thank Elizabeth. Uh, I'd like to thank Carolyn uh, and George, uh, who've been our co-hosts. This has been a you know fantastic experience. Looking forward to everything we have to uh, do in 2024. Uh, we've got some super guests coming up in 24. Um, so please do keep out uh, an eye out for that. Please do join us. Please do sign up, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, for uh, the podcast. Um, so, you know, this week, I just wanted to call your attention to a presentation that we did on defining and delivering value-based care for the Wagner Health Network at NYU. Uh, please uh, request via the webcast page on our website. There's a form there. You can go out, fill out that and get that on. Uh, please uh, join us and follow us at Healthcare Strategy Bullpen. Uh, please look for us at, on at Healthcare Pen on Twitter slash X, however you refer to it. Uh, think of us as the Rosetta Stone between culture and the language of healthcare and technology. We help you adapt and deploy your healthcare tech to improve the lives of patients. Um, so diagnosing health tech will be off the next two weeks as we take some time to enjoy the holidays and New Year's with our families. Uh, and please join us January 11th. Uh, we will have a best of episode. Uh, and please make sure to join us on January 18th. Uh, where We'll have a wrap of the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. So diagnosing health tech is also brought to you by Redox, the leader in healthcare data integration and the final plug that I'll have is, is again, our podcast. So Diagnosing Health Tech is available on every podcast platform. So you can just search for Diagnosing Health Tech and then subscribe. But thank you again for joining us. We'll see you in the new year. Take care. Thank you.